All right, good morning, everybody. We are taking a slight break from fractions today, checking out something with a little bit of a twist to it. Get ready for lesson 93. We're talking about comparative graphs. Now, we've already done some graph work before, but every type of graph, whether it was a bar graph or a pictograph, was only showing one type of data. Comparative graphs are used to display two or more sets of related data. In this case, we're talking about the average daily high temperature, and they're telling you both January's high temperature and July's daily high temperature, right? So it's a little bit different there. And the secret to any type of success with graphs is to read all of the information on a graph. Remember, you want to read the title. That's telling you what the graph represents. Really important to read the legend or the key. That will tell you what the symbols on the graph stand for. The vertical axis labels, that will tell you right here that we're talking about temperature in Fahrenheit. And the horizontal axis labels, like Rome, Italy, and Paris, France, well, that's obviously talking about different cities around the world, right? And it's about that simple as long as you read all of the information. So let's dive right into it here. Here they are asking, in which city was the average July temperature the highest? So I want to go over here to my legend. July temperature is the red bar. So I want to know where is my highest red bar, right? And it looks like it's right here, so the answer would be London, England, right? That has the highest July temperature. Check out this one. In which city was the average January temperature the lowest? So your January temperature is your blue bar, so I'm looking for my shortest blue bar in which case it would be right here for Washington, D.C., right? Which city had the smallest range between these temperatures? Remember, the range is the difference when you subtract, right? So I want to look for the most space between January and July. And this is going to be tricky. I can't quite tell if I'm talking London, England, or if I'm talking Washington, D.C., I might actually have to go and do some math on this one. Looks to me like in London, England, my high temperature is 85 degrees. And my low temperature, if I take a look at it closely, appears to be 30 degrees. So that's going to go ahead and give me a range of 55 degrees, right? So... It's a little bit trickier with the range. Let's go and see what else we have going on for Washington, D.C. I have a high temperature of 80, and I have a low temperature of what appears to be about 21 degrees. So 80 minus 21 would be 59 degrees, right? So, sometimes you might have to break out the math. It might not be so easy as to just looking at it. And the greatest range is Washington, D.C. In which city is the average January temperature higher than the average July temperature? Where is the blue bar higher than the red bar? It is in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And technically not a math question. I'll toss it in, though. Do you know why? Because Brazil is in the southern hemisphere, so their seasons are reversed. When we're having winter, those guys down there are having summer. Check out this. We have a new graph talking about population growth. Line graphs show data over time. So on the horizontal axis... I have a bunch of decades, right, starting in 1950, going to 2000. Along the vertical axis, 
that is the number of the population. Like if there was 100,000 people living in the town, or 200,000 people, 300,000, etc. The blue line is tracking the population of a city called Austin, Texas. The red line is tracking the population of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So our first question up for grabs right now is, what was Austin's population in 1970? So Austin is the blue line, and I want to find 1970. It appears to be right about here, halfway in between the 300,000 label and the 400,000 label. What number would be about halfway in between? That sounds about like 350,000 people living in Austin, Texas in the year 1970, right? Go and look at the graph. Maybe it might not be labeled exactly, but using the two pieces of information, you should be able to get it figured out. So let's go ahead and try this one now. How much did Pittsburgh's population decrease between 1950 and 2000? Pittsburgh has been declining in population the whole time. So it looks like in 1950, they had about 700,000 people living in Pittsburgh, almost a million. Pretty good sized town. It beats whatever size towns we have in North Dakota, right? So 700,000 people living there in 1950, but by the time the year 2000 rolls around, they are down to about 350,000 again. It's that halfway point between 300,000 and 400,000, right? So 700,000 minus 350,000. Can we do this one mentally? What's 700 minus 350? Not sure if you can do it or not. I can. It's going to be 350,000 again, right? You could go ahead and do all that borrowing, but if you know that half of 700 is 350, it makes it a whole lot easier. Check out this one. In what year were Austin and Pittsburgh's population? Almost the same. Where did they converge? Right about here is where the two lines are meeting. So what year was that? Looks like it was the year 1980. And that, my friends, is the end. You might need a small scratch piece of paper to make it through this crowd of quiz, and good luck.